Good afternoon. There's still like more than two people in the hall. So really, we are like stepchildren usually, the last panel. But we won't be. We will probably be the best. Um, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. Um, let me just take you through a few things uh, before we start the panel. As we emerge from the pandemic that has claimed over 6 million lives globally, and even this number is not necessarily accurate, we find deeper inequalities and fault lines emerging across societies. It has affected the entire world, not least humanity, like no other phenomenon. No one was spared, no country, no region, no territory, no society. While the environment may have enjoyed cleaner air and unpolluted rivers and lower carbon emission, while we were all on a lockdown of some form, that temporary relief for environment is today yet again threatened by floods as we experienced in the Klang Valley, plane crashes, landslides and volcano eruptions, existing and new wars in different parts of the world and social compliance issues as businesses begin again to require foreign workers. These new ESG entrants, in addition to the existing ones, are con and with the continuing pandemic or endemic in some parts of the world continues to have profound impact on societies, on, on some societies and disastrous in many. The people living in famine-like conditions have increased to almost six folds as we open our borders, lift the restrictions and seek normality. So what have we learned over the last two years? One key learning is it showed us that what is at the core of life, and that is dignity to human lives. Therein lies the topic of sustainability and ESG. As we all know, sustainability was introduced to provide that dignity back to humanity, where for some time it was replaced by data and numbers. So as we stand at this crossroad of new normal today, the country looks at people like ourselves and yourselves, the policymakers of today and the change makers of tomorrow, to provide ways to adapt to an increasingly unpredictable era. So the, so the question isn't just how do we reinforce our collective systems, making them more robust and resilient, but the question really is how do we reinforce our collective systems, making them more robust and more resilient and more equitable? How do we make these systems fitting of global standards? How do we standardize these systems? For often, in these scenarios of disaster, the poor, the vulnerable, and the fragile suffer the most. So the question today that we have to at least make some uh, road, some uh, forward roads into is what can financial institutions continue to financial institutions continue to operate as they can financial institutions continue to operate as they did in this new iterative of sustainability or do they need to operate differently hence the topic sustainability in banking how how can banks promote ESG so let me begin uh, before I hand over the panel to uh, my uh, panelists and introduce them show you some topical headlines which you might already have seen okay Legal action against shell boards. UK must uh, abandon phobia of hydrocarbons, so they're, they're going backwards. Uh, why ESG funds are full of weapons. Sorry, I can't see without my glasses. <laughs> what, what's the, uh, yeah. Yeah. So SEC proposes uh, companies to disclose climate risk and emissions. Uh, Malaysia and its, uh, and its flood. Demand for sustainable funds wanes with Ukraine war. And as the West are vigilantly uh, going into sanctions, the Asia Asian countries are sitting back amidst the war. And what does that mean to sustainability? Uh, how child labor is being used for, to fuel electric cars, which is supposed to be sustainable. What's down there? 
and then social, e social compliance issues in Malaysia and uh, greenwashing. So, my name is Fairuz Abdul Hamid, as I've been introduced. We have with us today a fantastic panel with five distinct and accomplished panelists. If I can just briefly introduce them. To my extreme right, Ms. Luencia, Managing Director and Head Group Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility of CIMB Group. On my right, Mr. Nazri Omar, Managing Director, Ban Pembangunan Malaysia Berhad. On my left, Mr. Bilal Parvis, Executive Director and Head of Islamic Business Products, Ten Chart uh, Bank Malaysia. To the extreme left, Mr. Justin Ong, Deloitte Malaysia Risk Advisor Leader. And online, I can't see him, Mr. Promot Das, Deputy CEO, Ram Holding Malaysia. So we'll get three perspectives, one from a local, large local commercial bank, one from a DIFI, one from a global uh, perspective of commercial and Islamic banking, and then a, reg a risk management perspective, followed by regulatory perspective. And then uh, we'll go into the Q&A, and I invite you to be interactive in this Q&A. So can I invite you to present, uh, Duane? Yes, um, thank you, Faris. The middle is the next. The middle is the next, okay. Right, the middle is the next, that works. Okay, so um, yeah, I was asked to talk about, you know, um, how uh, banks can play a role in sustainability and ESG. But I think before we go into how and what we're doing, the question is, why should we do it, right? Um, are we doing it because, you know, we feel nice and fluffy and we feel guilty for uh, uh, wrecking things for our children and our future generations? Well, uh, yes, that is part of it, but that is only a very, very, very tiny part of it. So if you look at the slide, um, first thing is, yes, let's be clear. It's part of our values. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. But actually, all those fluffy things aside, right, they are very, very strong business reasons why we're doing it. First of all, it protects enterprise value. So for example, if you're in a bank and you're giving out a 30-year mortgage, surely you want to know um, whether in 15 years' time, that house, is it still going to be there? Or is it going to be underwater? Right? So this is, so not looking at sustainability is like walking along a cliff edge road with your blindfold on, on purpose. Because now everybody is telling you, uh, hey, you're on a cliff edge, uh, you better look properly, and then you put on your blindfold. Okay, so, so, so it, it, number one, it helps to protect the bank, but secondly, it's also investing in the future, right? We know that specific industries are sunset industries. We know that in place of those, there will be newer, greener industries. So do you want to be the main banker for the newer, greener in industries, or do you want to be the banker who are stuck with the brown clients who you know are not going to be around in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah. Um, now, then how do we do this, right? Um, as a bank, we are an intermediary. We are a facilitator. So we can help to channel money into the areas that are greener and that need it, but also we play a very large encouragement role with our clients to encourage them to do better stuff. Of course, there's also, especially with the BNM, uh, CCPT and ED, uh, uh, climate risk um, requirements, we can also say, hey, if you don't behave yourself, we're not gonna lend you money, right? So, so we have a very strong influencing role as well. But not just that. Everybody's asking for it. Our investors are asking for it. Our customers are asking for it. Our regulators, of course, our employees are asking for it. There's a statistic that says that um, all else considered, an employee would take a 15%, one five, not five zero, 15% pay cut to work for a company that is more sustainable. Okay, so think about that in terms of employee attraction. Very big deal. Okay, um, so. As far as said, you know, a uh, large local bank, ASEAN Bank, uh, we only started in late 2018. And in late 2018, we were at the bottom 20% of banks globally. In just four years, we are now close to top 
20% globally. And we did this largely in-house. We had one consultant on retainer, is a boutique consultancy, but apart from that, everything was done in-house. Uh, sorry, I just didn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it's very, it sounds scary. It sounds, you know, there's a lot of terminology, there's a lot of technical stuff, but actually, it's very, very doable. I mean, we did it in four years. Um, there's a long way to go. And actually, if you think you're very far behind, the global banks and things like that, you're not really. They only started also four or five, five years ago. Yeah, so it's just it's critical to take that first step. So how did we start? We started with a strategy. We started with setting out a department. We started with the key policies. And then we started looking at the risk side, specifically on lending to the higher sectors. And then once those, the, the safety nets were in place, we then moved on to putting in place uh, targets for the products, services, etc. We have now recently enhanced our commitments and you can see them here. So uh, very recently, we announced that we will be a net zero bank by 2050. And what that means is that in our financed emissions portfolio, so of all our clients and all our financing, we take a share of their carbon emissions. By 2050, our total client's carbon emissions needs to be offset by total client's sequestration. So I don't know how many bankers out there, but how, do you know uh, how many of you have clients who are actually sequestering carbon? Very, very few, right? So to get to that neutral state by 2050, it's a tall order, but um, I guess the, 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 the risk of not doing it is that, you know, uh, we'll get runaway climate change and uh, all of you who have kids, um, yeah, better start preparing. Okay, uh, so that is on climate change. We also have targets on coal, so no new coal, exiting coal entirely by 2040, and DPE, as well as a sustainable finance target, and of course, on social impact. Right, so now how do we look at this? And I, because I'm the first speaker, I just want to give a, a context of how we look at this. First of all, everything that we do, we look at two perspectives. So one is, how do we reduce our negative impact? How, and that is what we call the footprint. So you, you've heard of carbon footprint, but we have got other stuff. We've got water footprint, we've got waste footprint, we've got human rights footprint. That's all the bad stuff. We're trying to minimize the bad stuff. At the same time, just minimizing bad stuff, huh? because you can minimize as much as you can, you will never get to zero carbon footprint on your own. The fact that you're eating, breathing, sitting in aircon room means you have a carbon footprint. So in order to to get to net zero, we need to have positive stuff. So things that are actually creating positive impact. Yeah? So in everything that we do is always minimize bad stuff, maximize good stuff. And we do this throughout the entire business. From upstream, how we buy, what we buy, who we buy from, our operations, our call centers, our data centers, etc., and to our products and services. Now, as a bank, our... Um, Scope three emissions, what we um, facilitate, the carbon emissions that are emitted by our clients is 700 times bigger than our direct emissions as a bank. So, you know, it, whenever a bank says, okay, I'm going to be net zero or carbon neutral, you go and ask them, is this only your office electricity? That's your scope one and two which is very, very small. Compare that to your finance emissions that's 700 times larger. So any bank who's saying it's just scope one and two, uh, that is, sorry, that is uh, greenwashing. I hope I'm not offending anyone here. Okay. Now, okay, so on, on again, the positive and negative, right? First of all, we try and maximize the positive impact through the products and services, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got brilliant uh, things like our EcoSafe savings account. There's a certain uh, percentage of deposit that gets uh, put to green causes. We have our micro biz ready, our green biz ready, which is like a one-stop consulting uh, for green uh, SMEs who wanted to go green. Now let's talk about a bit about the harm, right? So Let's say, let's say I lend money to a pummel company who is deforesting and uh, going around abusing human rights and things like that. If we are lending money to this company who is doing all this bad stuff, directly or indirectly, we are condoning what they're doing. Yeah? And again, uh, if you say, I never ask, I never know, 
again, you are going with your blinkers on. And this is not just an ethical issue. Eh? There are so many cases where companies get caught doing bad things and they have financial impact. Look at what happened with certain glove companies, certain palm oil companies. Oh, sorry. Um, and <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, certain electronic manufacturers, right? Their share price went down by like 80 over percent. So it's 95. It's credit risk to the bank. So I'm not just doing this because I'm such a good person, but it's actually credit risk. So that is at the transaction and the client level. But when you look at your overall portfolio, how is that portfolio performing? And let me show you a bit about that. So these are some of the things that we look at, uh, some of the risks we look at in our transactions. Yeah? So it's, obviously it's climate change, deforestation, water scarcity, uh, waste and pollution, but social as well. The human rights thing is massive. And um, we're starting to go and talk to clients. We've, we're putting in place a policy and saying, you must have these three things. If you don't have these three things, either you have to agree to have these three things within X number of months, years, or, but if you don't agree, sorry, I can't lend any money to you. Right? So, so it, this is how we can encourage our clients to do the right thing. I know it's such a cliche, right? But still. Now, Importantly, how do we do this at a portfolio level? I know all of us talk about you know, climate risk, climate change, but how does it become credit risk to us, right? So it's transition risk, which is you know, how, when companies are shifting away from browner industries. So for example, if, if you know, there is a company today that is making plastic straws and only makes plastic straws, would you lend money to that company? No, because the whole world is starting to ban plastic straws and, and single-use disposable plastic bags, right? So that is an example of transition risk. So the question is, oh, that one is a case that we know already, right? But the question is, in the next few years, which industries are going to get hit in a similar way? So this is where we look at transition risk. We already know that globally, we're trying to halve carbon emissions by 2030. Malaysia has a 45% reduction in carbon by 2030. So we know that the government policies are going that way. And which industries will then be impacted because they are too high carbon? We have things like the EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Two thirds of our exports are going to be hit by this carbon tax when it gets Im imported into the EU. This is additional cost to our exporters if they don't become greener. So all these things translate into financial risks, which is why we care about it. Well, part of the reason that, of course, it's part of the right thing as well. That is always the baseline, so don't forget that. But it's also business reason, right? Now, looking at our overall portfolio, right, what do we do? First, we need to measure our financed emissions, right? And for a bank, we have thousands of borrowing clients. It is really going to every single one and trying to estimate their emissions and trying to minimize that emission. So it's a, quite a difficult process, but not impossible. Um, I won't go through this slide, but these are all the various things that we are looking at to try and reduce our um, financed emissions. Yeah? And this is the one that is 700 times greater than your own emissions. And by the way, this is in our sustainability report, which we have published um, very recently. Now, this is, um, oh my goodness, there is a note to our internal team, which was not taken up my slide, but never mind. Okay, so yes. <laughs> so this is a tool called PACTA, P-A-C-T-A, which is scenario analysis. So all of you who have read the Bagnagara ED on climate change, you would have heard scenario analysis. What are we doing scenarios on? We're doing scenarios on sustainable development scenarios, okay? So do governments stick with their um, carbon emission targets or the reduction targets? And if they do, which industries need to go away? Based on that, are we banking those industries? So very, very specific projections that we have here. So if you just look at that middle chart, this is one example. If you're uh, if your bank's portfolio is in the red line, that means you're not aligned with the sustainable development scenarios. That means where the policies shift, you will be at risk of uh, losing money because of transition risk and stranded assets. You see that happening with coal. 
Very similar thing happening elsewhere, okay? So you wanna be in the green area to minimize your transition risk. We can't do this alone. Um, so we do this as part of a local network, CEO Action Network, um, which uh, many of the local companies are part of, Net Zero Banking Alliance. They give you tools, they keep you on the straight and narrow, and helps you to starve off greenwashing. PCAF to measure uh, emissions, and TCFD. So we've just done our first TCFD reporting this year, and um, if you read the Bank Nagara requirements, you, every bank needs to do this by December 2024. And um, again, the Bank Nagara blueprint, financial services blueprint, says that by 2026, half of every dollar, so if, let's say you give out a loan of $1, 50 cents or more needs to be green or transitioning to green. So that is how mainstream sustainable finance needs to be. Where are we today? Way, 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 uh, far, far away from it. So a long way to go. Okay, so that's all for me. Um, you can get in touch with me at uh, this email address if you've got any questions. Always happy to share. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks, Luan. So before I go to Nazri, just a couple of questions on your slides for you to think about. Then we'll come back to you at the end, yeah? So um, you mentioned that uh, the commitment on 2050 and how you need to take the companies that you're financing along with you. So the companies that you're you're targeting, would they also have triple bottom line uh, targeted? Because most Malaysian companies, as even public listed companies, have not accustomed themselves with triple bottom line. Maybe banks have. Uh, I'm quite sure even pu leading public listed companies have not. So how do you address that? And then the number two is um, you rose quite fast from 2018 to currently, four years. Um, so the question really is, did you do it in spite of the policy uh, readiness in the country? So was the government leading you or were you leading the market? So those are a couple of questions that came to mind as you were presenting. Now over to Nasri. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Can you guys hear me at the back? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Salam sejahtera. A very good afternoon. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to join this esteemed uh, panel. And on a topic that's, of course, uh, very hot uh, in everyone's mind uh, for the last few years already as it is. But it will continue to go even more and more important as we move along uh, in our journey. Uh, since Luan did a great job at explaining from a commercial bank perspective, uh, let me then try and tackle from a DFI or Developmental Financial Institution perspective. Now, um, it is still a journey for DFIs as well, just like as for commercial banks. But the difference here is to start off uh, what, uh, what was shared by Luan compared to what DFI has to face. The question of why. Why is DFI engaging on sustainable finance? <clears throat> well, first and foremost, you have to all appreciate that the mandate for a DFI is developmental and as a positive, create a positive economic impact. However, it has to be done on a sustainable basis. Now, that's the mandate. Now, some DFIs are very specific mandate, agriculture, uh, or infrastructure, or SME. Some have a more broader mandate, just more broader perspective. So the issue with DFIs uh, to start off with is twofold. Now, you may have a specific mandate or you may have a broad mandate like developmental or economic impact on a sustainable basis. But the first question then we have to ask ourselves is, who deserves to be onboarded as a client for a developmental financial institution? Yeah? Because we are here uh, entrusted, responsible for public funds, yeah? public taxpayers' funds. And we're here for a reason, to create positive economic impact. So we have to choose wisely who deserves to be supported. Now, it goes without saying, uh, for developmental financial institutions, our clients tend to be higher risk than the commercial banks. It also goes without saying. So the question is, which higher risk customer should we support? So, so this question of who deserves the financing. And the second one related to that, of course, uh, at the end of the day, once we've done that, is how do we measure it? Yeah? Uh, so this is always a dilemma. And as I said, back then, if it's uh, infrastructure or anything infrastructure, we finance. And ag agriculture, if that's the mandate, everyday agriculture, we finance. But then people start questioning, hey, but that's Saim Dhabi. Why are we financing Saim Dhabi? Or that's Tanaga. Why are we financing Tanaga? Is that really the mandate? Or should we be serving the underserved, those who are having trouble accessing credit, for argument's sake, even though it is... Uh, still part of the mandate, but should that be the target market? Uh, so that's the start, questions start coming up. 
Now, when we target the right customers who are high risk, who cannot be banked by any other banks, then when something goes wrong, also it asks again the question, why are we finance such a high risk company? Yeah, you have to answer this to the stakeholders because we're entrusted with this. So therein lies the dilemma for DFIs. And once we do it, then the question of how we measure it in terms of successfulness. Yeah? So given that uh, preamble or that beginning or that uh, issue statement out there, uh, the, we took the opportunity when the government and uh, the public sector all started pushing and highlighting the need for ESG, that this also can dovetail nicely with the developmental uh, impact or the mandate. Yeah? Uh, so how do we determine who deserves to be financed? And then how do we measure it? So for BEM Pembangunan, uh, very early on, 2019, we started the journey by signing up for the United Nations uh, Environmental Program, FI. Um, we learned from the United Nations, and then we also touched base and reached out to World Bank, and we looked at the sustainable developmental goals that they set up uh, two few years ago. And we looked at all this, and we worked with the World Bank uh, starting late 2020 to come up with what we call a developmental framework. Uh, it's actually acronym as M-I-N-D, Measuring Impact on National Development. So what we did was, we took the six, six we highlighted, we picked up six sustainable development goals, six SDGs, and we also took what Ben Negara's uh, objectives or agenda in terms of financial blueprint and economic, uh, uh, what do you call it, impact assessment that needed to be done, like climate risk, as well as the government's strategic economic objectives. We took all these points and we came up with 32 indicators. 26 of it related to social economic indicators. Six of those related to financial efficiency indicators. So now that we have this framework, now what do you mean by indicators? It's a simple thing. Indicators means questions that you ask a client. If they meet those indicators, they get a certain point. Simple as that. If they don't meet, maybe the point is not so high or it'll be less or even be negative. So at the end of the day, there's actually a, a formula to calculate what is the score for the client for the 26 key indicator from a social perspective and from a financial efficiency perspective. Now, why I differentiate between social, economic efficiency and financial? The financial one also is important for DFIs because it touches upon the credit worthiness of the client. You also touch about bringing in private capital to support the, the financing, not just DFI doing everything and not crowding out uh, some of the more commercial deals that commercial bank can do. So there's also a, another aspect to this in DFI. So if you can imagine, there is an X and Y axis, you know, there's SEI axis and the Y axis, and when we score the client, we can box them into a matrix. Which quadrant do they fall in? There's the high impact, which is uh, high social economic and high effic financial efficiency that we should prioritize. There is also the moderate quadrants that maybe not so high in terms of development score, but still there. Uh, or the credit is not so great, but the developmental score is great. So in one fell swoop, what we have done is effectively solve who deserves it from a, from a filtering, one first point of filtering. Yeah? The second point, of course, is once we have filtered it and we've onboarded it, there's a way to measure the impact because these people bring on board developmental, uh, 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 what do you call this, impact from all those criteria of the six SDGs, the climate risk, you know, and all these things. Uh, so there is a score to keep track. And some of those questions are even statual statistics, such as job created, you know, uh, replanting, how much carbon. And so there's a lot of these things that can be measured. So in, by coming up with this MIND framework, we solve the question of try to identify who deserves to be financed from a DFI perspective, and second, how to measure it. Yeah? Uh, so that's our journey. We started early last, uh, towards middle of last year. About 100 potential customers, we went through the score. Uh, rated them and posted them in those quadrants and focused on the areas that we should prioritize, the high and the moderate uh, uh, quadrants, so to speak. Now, it's still a journey. Uh, not all of them, of course, passed and uh, got approved. Uh, there were other issues as well from a credit, but that is a start to begin with. Now, just to wrap it up, there are also challenges, of course, as part of the journey. The first challenge, there's three challenges here. The first and foremost, as with any data, there needs to be a data validation. Uh, so the, the, the challenge, of course, is always how do you validate the customer's data? Uh, and then, of course, you need to benchmark it against some data. And we use the national statistics to, on some of these things to benchmark it against. So that's always the challenge number one. And we are refining it as we're going along, obviously. The second point here is now, this is where the DFI comes in. Uh, customer score is low to moderate. 
Does that mean they don't deserve? Now, this is also an interesting part because the client may not be deserving it today based on where they are today, but what they want to raise the financing is a change in terms of their profile going forward. So in the future, they will be a high score uh, customer, so to speak. So in a way, the word that uh, Luan used, they're in a transition mode. And so some people, uh, some corporate commercial banks may just shy away because they, want, they don't want to deal with them because they have high or high level of customers that is uh, negative, right? So you don't want to add on another negative. But for us as a developmental, we think this customer deserves a chance to be converted along the way. Yeah, so today they're not great, uh, but they have to be there. So even the score is low, moderate, we have another, able, uh, another uh, aspect to it, which is a narrative in terms of what they plan to do with the financing and how they want to change themselves. And that also can justify why they should be deserving. Yeah? So that's the challenge number two. Um, the third challenge, as with all these uh, things about ESG, and you hear it all the time, of course, is monitoring that they comply <laughs> or they continue doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and because we're at the start of the journey, right now we're just starting on the monitoring. And the question that will be posed to us as well as all the bankers is, what happens when the client doesn't comply? Does that mean you pull the plug and pull back the line? You know, that would be catastrophic, obviously. But then what are the options then to us? Uh, raising the price of financing? You know, so that it becomes painful for them. Uh, is that right in that, that regard? And then the question, if you want to do that, then the measurements got to be accurate and fair because they will say that you are purposely increasing the rates, for example, right? Uh, so this is the third challenge that is part of the journey going forward. Uh, that is going to be, uh, but from my perspective, at least personally, the third one has to be handled with uh, a balance, yeah? Uh, it's got to be a little bit of guidance from the bankers, a little bit of guidance and cajoling and getting them on the right path as well as some incentive or disincentive at the same time. So that's just a, my short five minutes start. Oh, is that five minutes? Oh, thanks, thanks, Nazri. So uh, before we move to Balal, a uh, couple of questions came to mind, um, triggered uh, based on your, your sharing. DFIs report to different ministries in the government, um, although centrally uh, to Bank Nagara in one perspective, but it has different stakeholders. You have prescribed, and in addition to that, you have prescribed and non-prescribed DFIs, non-prescribed being your Felda and your Maras and the like. Um, so in the layman terms, you are banking and non-banking DFIs. How do, it, speaking of standardization, how do DFIs collectively standardize ESG in what is not standard, in, in a non-standardized environment, number one. Number two, you spoke a lot about um, data validation, scoring, and monitoring. So when companies like Felda and Syme Dhabi get sanctioned, do you pull the plug on them? Uh, yeah, your question. So, uh, and then, um, because these are highly resourced company, and, and if they get stuck in their supply chain, not, not necessarily them, like for example, in, um, case in point was Thai Union in Thailand, um, one of their supply chains had forced labor issues, so Thai Union got sanctioned, right? So it, wasn't a, it was because of the supply chain. So it could be also supply chain issues. So it, how equipped a bank uh, 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 is financial industry in understanding supply chain mapping and issues and data, uh, data manning, as it were, uh, in, the, in its clients? So think about that while we listen to Bilal. Thank you. And uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. So thanks to KSI for this opportunity. So I just start off uh, quickly on a, on a few slides, taking everyone across on the sustainable finance journey at Standard Chartered. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room knows Standard Chartered. It is the first bank in Malaysia and a, uh, a UK-based bank focused on emerging markets. So we call Asia, Africa, and the Middle East as our home. And uh, Malaysia is uh, a very important uh, top 10 market for us. And we have been there. Actually, actually banking in Malaysia started with Strand Chart. So we were the first bank in Penang. Uh, sorry, can I have the uh, top slides? Okay. 
Okay, so uh, before moving forward, let me just cover why is sustainability so important. I mean, Luan and Nazri and Fairoz during her introduction has spoken about the, 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 the same. But if we look at it holistically, why the world wants to do this, what is the Paris Agreement, what are the UN SDGs, what is in it for us, is it, are we doing it for the future generations, how can companies think profit and purpose together? moving away from an entirely commercial approach to a socially driven approach towards adapting ESG, sustainable practices, not just for today, but the future. That's probably the theme. And what we are doing in Malaysia from a banking perspective, from a Islamic banking perspective, at a government level, regulatory level, translating it to the corporates via Bursa, via Securities Commission, there's a lot of work going on. So hopefully we can cover all of that during our session. But before that, let me just uh, go through quickly through the, uh, through the uh, slides. So uh, sustainability and the ESG adaption started in the West. We have seen uh, the big global banks take on this agenda. And then uh, the Asia focus or the emerging market focus banks, HSBC, China Chart also starting this off. Uh, we have seen uh, various international forums, WEF, uh, the Davos Forum, etc., also talking about it, the leaders, the, the, the governments, the chief executives pledging their uh, commitments. Malaysia has committed a net zero goal. Saudi Arabia has come up with a net zero uh, goal, which is qu quite interesting. It's, it's a very oil-based economy. So this is how the commitments are being done. And I was just reading yesterday, Aqua, Aqua Power, which is a huge uh, power utility provider in the Middle East, they've started selling off their oil investment, their, their fossil fuel investments. So that's like a first step towards re uh, achieving net zero. Then we see the regulatory focus. So PRA, the Prudential Regulatory Authority in UK, where, who governs uh, UK-based banks. Uh, we have been doing climate risk uh, stress testing on our banks, on our portfolios uh, in all markets. We did that for Malaysia as well. Uh, then we have TCFD, which is a uh, reporting requirement, which is now being implemented in Malaysia as well. And then closer to the home, we have seen uh, value-based intermediation uh, by BNM, which started off in 2018. Then we recently we have seen the CCPT. We have also seen the Joint Committee on Climate Change, which is working together, a collaborative effort between BNM, Securities Commission, and all the banks. Uh, and we, with all this activity being done, I think the platform is set, the stage is set uh, to how to now drive this opportunity across to the corporate, commercial, and the SME sectors in the, in the market. And being, as Luan said, being the financial intermediaries, it's upon the banks on how we want to control this uh, narrative and uh, move it uh, down the value chain. So for Strandchart, this journey started back in the day. So the initial philanthropic or the CSR, CSR activity dates back to, to uh, 2000, and then the focus came 2008 onwards on sustainability. That's where we, I, I, when, I, when I speak on this, I always see that it has gradually progressed from CSR to, to uh, preventing the negative. I think that was the first step, that let, no, let's not our actions be resulting into a, furthering, a further negative impact on the economy on the society uh, which where we operate and that's where we have defined position statements so when we are dealing with a client in coal in uh, uh, forestry palm oil uh, automotive high exclusive sectors chemicals we have clear guidelines position statements which are derived on international standards and frameworks and locally implemented to making sure that our clients do not enter into that orange or a red zone where they are seeing as harming the planet and our dollar being used to support the same. And those position statements have been there for last decade plus and obviously they are being refreshed annually as it's a very fast moving environment, it's very agile uh, regulation, standards, local changes keep coming up so we need to uh, adapt to it. And recently uh, since 2016-17 uh, that's where we started taking sustainable finance as a means to creating a positive impact. So what started as a CSR philanthropic activity moved on to preventing the negative harm and now we are very much focused as, as an organization on sustainable finance with an agenda to drive 50% of our income through sustainable finance activities and be the most, most sustainable bank in the, in, the, 
in the world. That's where our agenda is. And the commitment that the bank has made is USD 300 billion of sustainable or transition finance by 2030. So that's where we are, very high ambitions, and we have been progressing well globally as well as in Malaysia. So what are the three major pillars when we approach sustainability? First of all, it's alignment to SDGs. We all know that the major SDG gap is in emerging markets, Asia, parts of Asia, and more importantly, in Africa. However, the funding which is going on, on supporting SDGs is not where it's required the most. So that's a, that's a huge gap that we are seeing. So as an emerging market bank, being the largest bank in Africa, in the largest international bank in Africa, we see this as our, you know, agent, uh, as our strategy or, uh, or giving back to the community, giving back to the countries where we operate in to support the adaption of ESG by providing financing for healthcare, education, because the needs on SDGs, which are 16, vary from what you see in the US and the Europe than what you see in the emerging markets or the underdeveloped markets. So in one market, sanitation, clean water, healthcare might be a requirement. In US, the company might be talking, okay, how do we make our entire operation green? Or how do we have an entire, entirely a circular uh, operation? So these needs are very, are, are, are determined or very linked to how or where in this, the economic journey that particular country is. So as bankers, we need to adapt and we need to be reactive. So I can't go and talk to uh, uh, you know, a, a client in Africa and talk about you know, GHG and have a net zero when they don't even have clean water or they don't have roads, they don't have the infrastructure, right? So that's where you need to be agile, you need to be adaptive, and then you need to be reactive and make sure that you are able to serve the needs in the market where you operate in. So that's what we are trying to do, uh, alignment, aligning the SDGs. Moving on to the responsible finance element, that's where we have a strong governance culture inside the bank. Our own supply chain uh, practices some of the uh, principles on labor rights, etc., uh, so that we uh, make sure that our operations, our suppliers, meet the minimum minimum ESG requirements. And then is the environment where we are talking about the climate, the pollution, and the waste and biodiversity, and the bi prohibited sectors. So there are some certain sectors where we don't bank as as an institution. So if a client comes in, we won't be supporting those sectors. There are certain sectors where we work with our clients to bring them above the line. So if their operations currently are preventing or are creating a negative impact, we will still work with them. We have specialist team based in uh, our regional offices who will work with those customers to make sure that they meet, meet the minimum standards. That's where we come in as a responsible bank, working together uh, with our clients in an inclusive manner. And last is the impact-driven financing, where we see our financing creating that impact on, this, on the society and the economy where we operate. This is linked to SDGs. It comes in various, in various forms, such as social finance, such as uh, SMEs, lifting participation, women, in, uh, women empowerment. So these are various pillars which work together to ensure that whatever we are doing in our entire operation meets the SDG requirements. So in terms of product offering, not just globally, but in Malaysia, I do believe that uh, Sanchart has the most comprehensive uh, product suite uh, from loans, which are green, sustainable transition to bonds, uh, ESG advisory. So that's probably one of the most interesting things because ESG advisory is where, as a bank, you come and talk to your client. So if you're going to a company which is locally listed and you're talking to them about ESG ratings, ESG KPIs, benchmarking, what strategy they need to adopt, what sort of climate risk they face. A lot of these things might not be very relevant to the company as of date, because they wouldn't have heard of it or they would have just heard of it, but they don't know what to do about it. So that's where as bankers, we have ESG advisory team who can work with them to put up a framework, to put up specific KPIs, what are simple, uh, same companies in the same category doing. So if, a FMC, if it's an FMG company, we'll talk to them about Nestle, about Unilever, about other Asian giants, and so that they can do a peer uh, benchmarking and then uh, come up with it, uh, whatever is the framework that is required. Uh, then from a product suite, commercial banking, derivatives, supply chain, trade finance, and lastly, carbon trading, which we are launching uh, in Singapore with SGX. So it is an entire 
a huge uh, product suite. It is an entire uh, strategy that the bank is working on. In Malaysia, we have done some landmark transactions, but I do believe that we are just scratching the surface. We have actually done the first largest uh, ESG link with CIMB. Uh, then we have done this with RHB, with Ethica recently. We have done the first sustainable supply chain in Malaysia in Islamic format. So, but this is just the surface. There is an entire sea of opportunity in Malaysia that needs to be done. And I do believe that collectively, the banking industry, the regulator, the other stakeholders aligned together will be able to achieve or make a notable outcome as we jointly progress and move on this uh, strategic intent. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bilal. Just uh, again, a couple of questions that came to mind. Um, Stand Chart is amongst the leading global uh, financial institutions in Malaysia. And so from your um, experience of having been here what, about eight years now, yeah. Yeah, how do we in Malaysia compare uh, with uh, global standards, our peers? And then also um, from the Islamic finance pr perspective, um, how, does is how does Islamic finance contribute to ESG? Um, how does it converge with conventional finance? I, Nazri, you've done a lot of Islamic finance as well, so also directed to you the question. Um, because there is a um, question and as well as cynicism on um, how, what is moral, what is any ethical within conventional, and then it's transferred to Islamic finance, to greenwash or Islamic washed into moral and, and it being ethical. So that's a question to ponder as Justin presents his case. All right, great. Great to see a lot of you are staying back until 5 p.m. So totally understand that we are between you and traffic jam. So we, we keep it fast and quick, right? So I think, I think, the, I think at this point, you heard from the three bank, right? I think very ambitious three, three bank pressing very hard when it comes to sustainability agenda and journey. Um, we'd like to take it dif differently from uh, this discussion. I think one is flip from the industry and change it with a lens of a regulator. Trying to think about from authority pers perspective, what do they have in mind? And what are the expectation, ex expectation from the licensed bank, banks like some, some of you here? And the other part of the changes I'm trying to make is uh, zoom in a little bit from a broad ESG. Let's get down to a climate risk specific. All right, I think this, these are some of the changes I would, would be looking at. Can I have my slide up, please? All right, so as much as we think that the banking industries uh, have come a long, long way from a regulatory fund, right? Um, so you can see that this is really a busy slide, right? I think the land, landmark that how it get all started is, is very, very, very much from 2015, the whole formations of um, this, this CFD by the Financial Stability Board, FSB, right? The second landmark I just want to call out is MGFS, right? So the, the net, network for green fin financing, right? It's pretty much a network that com comprise of the, the authority, the, cen the cen central bank banker. They come together to form a com committee by issuing guidance, right? Some of the good practices that for the whole industry to, to use and to make ref re references of, right? So, and if you look at the kind of trend, right? I think we have kind of come a long, long way. And especially in December, as most of you are away during December last year, a few guidelines that just land, landed on lab, right? I think a few, one that I think is our, our home regulator, Bank Nagara, has issued an exposure draft on climate risk management and scenario analysis, right? APRA has done it in November. Hong Kong did it in December. United States Authority, OSS, OCC did it in December. So December looks like it's quite a happening month. Climate risk seems to be a top of mind while most of us were away during the last two, two weeks of, de of December. Let's look into the local front, right? So I think some of, some of the earlier panelists has talked about the financial sector blueprint, right? I like, I like the whole mantra, I like the whole directions that how, blue, blue, how the whole blueprint is being crafted, right? I think 
is pretty much based based on the three three perspective: finance for all, right, to drive financial inclusion, finance for transformations, continue em embedding transformations and technology as we are thinking about the future of financial sector, finance for succinctity, which is hit the core, the heart of the discussion for today, um, and Banagara is pretty much a very progressive authority when it comes to this front, right? In 2019, for those of you in the Islamic financial institutions, Islamic bank, Takafu, you have, you have adopted a guide, guideline that's called F v VBI, right? Um, CCPT, it was sometime last year, April, and then the exposure draft when it comes to climate risk management and scenarios, right? We'd like to take you a bit deeper when it comes to regulatory expectations, um, when it comes to a subject matter that's called climate risk management. If there's a magic number for everyone to take home, there will be 14, 14 and six, right? 14 is pretty much uh, spelled out the 14 principle that the Bank Negara has um, out outlined and expecting the financial institutions to adopt, right? Across the 14 principle, it cut across six a area. We'll not spend too much time in it, but just, just, just would like everyone to get a bit of fla flavor, right? Because this guideline is going to be effective pretty soon, right? Um, for those of you who have not read it, the effective date of this guideline is 1st June. As you're, as, as you're thinking about 2022, we are entering into April, right? So 1st June is about two months, right? So we got two months to get ourselves ready um, to, to, to trying to think about the implementations of the whole frame framework and what does it really mean and how, how are you think, thinking about Im implementing it, right? So it cut across, if you look at the exposure draft, um, I think by and large, it's closely in line with uh, BCBS, all right? So BCBS has, has published it. Um, so I think, I think in, in terms of the form and spirit, it's largely in, in line, but Benegar has taken it a lot more grand, granular, right? So I think let's look into the first pillar on gov governance. I think board oversight and climate risk, um, for I think for risk measure in the room, we, we will talk about tone from the top, right? So for, for any strategic directions as important as climate risk, it should be driven from top down. Um, the whole sound understanding of climate risk and a risk drive driver, some of the panelists earlier on talked about transmission channel. I think those, 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 those have to be well understood by the financial institution. Principle number three touch on embedding climate risk into frame framework, where they touch on three lines of def defense, right? So bring, bring, bring back some of the old school thing, thinking when it comes to um, risk management, the, gov the governance, the three, three lines. So climate risk is not the BU who are trying to look into lending. It's not the CRO agenda who are trying to embed risk. It's not, um, so everyone, right, across, including internal auditors, right? Um, some, of, some of my friends um, who are chief in, internal auditor, they've been having reg regular discussion with the authorities around how they are, I mean, what sort of audit pro, pro, pro program, what sort of checklist that have in, in, in place in providing assurance that climate risk is properly embedded as part of the, um, as, as part of the processes of, of the bank, right? So that's, that's the first pillar when it comes to gov governance. Second pillar is really the strategy, right? So as we're thinking about um, business plan planning, in, in 20 and 12, Ben and Garo up guideline that's called ICAP, right? So ICAP is kind of a game changer in the sense that it prompts all, all banks to embed capital planning, capital projection, capital con consumption as part of the business plan. Moving forward, what is new here? Clim climate, right? So climate has to be part of the whole um, business plan planning and strategy planning as, as we're think, thinking about the, the, the outlook. The third is really about risk appetite, right? So as climate risk be becoming a new emerging area in a whole risk taxonomy, so trying to think about what sort of risk appetite that we could set, right? So that we can draw, we, we, can, we can drive certain tone, tone from a top down. We can also set certain limit um, so that we can control the risk properly. Um, the fourth pillar is really about risk management. We'll not go into so much of details, right? But I think is you can't run away from identifying the source of the risk well and trying to assess it, right? And Luen earlier on touched on scenario analysis, 
where it presented on transition risk, right? So from a climate perspective, you've got physical risk and trend, trend, transition risk. Um, so that, that has to be properly understood in terms of your risk exposure, that link to your risk reporting, monitoring, et cetera. Um, now the, the fifth one is around scenario analysis, right? That is actually quite, quite interesting. Right? I'm currently working on a couple of projects when it comes to helping the FFI to uh, adopt certain scenario analysis, right? To, to understand the climate risk exposure as part of the, the entire, entire balance sheet and PL perspective, right? So we, we were trying to assess it from a capital pers perspective, the impact from profitability, the impact from e ECL, right? So read about um, stressing uh, result from some of the authority, right? If for those of you who want to read a bit more, three authority has conducted pi pilot testing, right? So I think those are ECB. Um, BOE as well as HKMA, right? So if I read the HKMA one, I think the ECL, which is your expected credit loss, has has shoot up the the the, the roof, right? When it comes to scenario analysis, uh, specifically on physical risk. Um, I think last lastly, very meaningful to us is all about this disclosure. So that's close closely linked to the the market discipline that we're trying to drive, right? We are trying to make make sure that. Um, we we discuss we, we make full full dis disclosure to various group of stakeholders so that to enable them to make well informed decisions. I think that's pretty much sum up. I think we'll leave you with a timeline that um, the regulator is working on. Um, in two months' time, I think um, if everything goes goes as planned, um, I think this these regulations will come live. Um, it's a, there's a tran transition plan plan here. By the end of um, 31st December 2023, I think four P pillars will come live. I think those are your governance, strategy, risk appetite, risk, risk management. Um, and when it comes to 31st December 2024, I think that's, that's when you see the dis dis disclosure bit. The whole adoption of TCFD reporting will come about, right? So with that, I think that sum up my sharing for today. Happy to take more que questions along the way. Thank okay, you. thanks. Thanks, Justin. And, and before we invite Promote online, um, with the flood that happened recently in Klang Valley, um, how are banks and regulators progressing uh, in that aspect of risk? And then also you spoke quite extensively on uh, your slide number five. Um, can't see it now, but um, on scenario analysis, uh, which is a project that you're working on, what happens in a scenario when uh, companies that have committed to abandoning fossil fuel then revert to it with vengeance in a scenario of war where oil price goes really high and so they have to make commitments back like BP and a lot of the oil companies have reverted back. So what happens in such a scenario where your entire model completely breaks down? And, and then on the topic of regulation, you spoke quite a bit on that. Uh, what's... Um, What's optimal? Is it more regulation, le less regulation, or self-regulation when ESG is uh, spoken about? And then finally, we invite Promote online. Promote? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Can you just yeah, put up your hand so that I know that you can hear me? Okay. Um, uh, for those who know me, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard for me to keep quiet for such a long time. <laughs> um, and uh, so that was the hardest part for me in this panel. Uh, so first, uh, first thing that I'm proud of, but I think while we're talking about climate change, um, uh, I may I might disappear from the screen if uh, the next lightning strike knocks off the electricity in my house. So it's not because I wanted to run off before I wanted to say a few things, but uh, I'll keep my points very short. Um, it's it's not easy to add on to. Uh, the very many points that are being shared, but um, let, let me um, give you a different perspective on things. Can you hear me? Sorry, I am speaking above the uh, loud rain. Yeah, yeah, can. Yeah, carry on. Okay, all carry right. On. Okay. Um, in essence, it is, it is, it is just this ESG is not new, sustainability is not new. Uh, if if you work in a bank or you work in a corporate that 
did business responsibly uh, and you carried on doing business responsibly for the last 30, 40, 50 years, then this is not new. It's, um, it's just a label. So um, I, I would guess nine out of ten, ten, uh, ten times a bank doesn't give you a loan. It's not because of the ESG reasons, but because you're not credit worthy. Um, and uh, so I think we also need to bring into perspective, uh, while a lot of attention has gone on ESG and climate change, banks um, are custodians of savings as well. And uh, they need to lend out and uh, protect the money on a risk adjusted basis. So um, I think the, the smartest thing about this or the unsung hero in this whole equation is the, uh, the environmentalists. Uh, and um, I say this because how Rand got started in this and how I got started into sustainable finance was um, an email from WWF that I received in somewhere along about this time in uh, 2015, uh, which initially I was going to delete because why would WWF write to me was an analyst in a rating agency. And then uh, it so happened I read it and it was really smart once I got to know the WWF people. So in the past, they would stand in front of the tree and stop the tractor from uh, mowing it down or stop the timber company or organize a protest. Then they figured out uh, that uh, who is financing the tractor? Let's go and camp outside the bank. Uh, then they figured out who owns the bank? It's either the government or investors or pension fund. So let's go and camp outside there. So that allowed the multiplier effect. And uh, what is sustainable finance is actually um, driven by those early activist movements. And uh, it became a global movement. So uh, if, if you look at it, the uh, Banks, uh, the regulators, insurance companies, stakeholders, um, people who monitor or uh, look at uh, risk uh, will continue to ask deeper questions on ESG or sustainability um, to find out whether all risk is being measured. And uh, my, my uh, quick parting point is all of this will sum up into either a, a corporate or a business receiving money or receiving money or not receiving money to fund the activities or receiving money at a higher or lower cost depending on whether they're doing good or doing harm. Uh, so in, in the past uh, risk was probably not priced accurately. Uh, it didn't take into account the, uh, the uh, cost to society, the cost to nature and environment, or the future implications of certain lending directions. So all this is being summed up in the risk premium. And uh, I think you saw many, many slides. Uh, eventually, um, there is also a business opportunity for those who, who are um, uh, pushing ahead. That means uh, if you're early into this game, uh, you also have a business priority. So uh, if you look at it, crisis, um, I think, uh, first you, you mentioned uh, the, uh, what COVID had done uh, and uh, the, the impact on uh, uh, where uh, cars go off the road and you know, less pollution. But depends on which perspective you take. Um, how many gloves have ended up in the sea? How many masks have ended up in the sea? How many businesses have profited uh, from these gloves and masks? And who, which are the banks or institutions that finance this? Uh, so as we speak, you can ask many more questions. And I think uh, greenwashing is the least of a problem and definition and standards are the least of our issues. So 
focus on, I think, the underlying drivers uh, when we look at ESG uh, and sustainability, but also keep an eye on the pricing. If the pricing doesn't move in the next five years, actually nothing much has changed. So I end with that. Thank you. So a um, couple of questions, then I'll go around again and then open the floor to questions because we are, we are at um, 510. Um, you, you spoke about WWF, right? Uh, hounding you. So um, it's not just... No, no, they, 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 they didn't hound me. They educated me. <laughs> oh, okay. They educated you. So uh, usually they do it gently or aggressively. Uh, for glove makers, they do it aggressively. Um, so in that, in that, from that perspective, how does the FIs and markets address the rising shareholder activism? Uh, against perceived incompliance of ESG, uh, now where boards are taken to account on personal capacities, yeah, like Shell's board was uh, sued on personal capacity for not complying with ESG's ESG commitments made at corporate level, right? Uh, and then also back to your point on um, on gloves and masks floating on seas and roads. How do banks and regulators assess now on the all topical, which Luan mentioned briefly, social incompliance issues, where our companies here, from glove makers to um, technology companies, and also palm oil, are getting sanctioned? And, and again, a question that I asked uh, Nazri earlier, how, how do we address the issue from the perspective of ESG and financial institutions. So if I can go around again to Luan on the couple of questions that I, you want to very quickly take us through? Yeah, sure. So your first question was, um, how do we get to net zero when our clients are not at net zero, right? Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, if we have a client who is emitting 100 tons, we need to finance another client who is absorbing 100 tons of carbon in order for us to be net zero. So that is really, really difficult. So th there are a couple of ways we do it. Um, first, of course, we want to find as many possible clients who are uh, sequestering, very few as of today, maybe nature-based solutions and a few of those. Um, or we bank more of those who are trying to get to net zero, those who have made a commitment. So, so we are actively hunting for, for those. Uh, but at the same time, we need, we do need to shift our existing clients away from the worst practices, if we can. But if they're recalcitrant, then we have to cut them. And we have walked away from deals because... Um, so if they are recalcitrant, mm -hmm. um, so the point being, uh, should, should there be um, regulations imposed on bank uh, on these companies that you're trying to get to uh, trying to get to to implement so that you don't have to find companies to absorb exactly uh, so so hence the second question i think which i asked you uh, you grew in spite of policy or because of policy uh, your esg business and how does that pan out to other industries in the in the market yeah, so, and, and this is why regulation is important because if we say, okay, oh, you're a terrible client, you're doing bad things to the environment, there's like, okay, bye bye, I just go to bank B down the road, right? And this is why we, we need regulation because there will be banks who are doing the right thing, you know, put in place things, but the vast majority will be looking at short term profits, right? The pressure from the board, from the investors, quarterly PL, et cetera. So we do need that regulation. When we started, we were ahead of regulation. The, I guess, uh, so, so, you know, um, as we talked about the PRB, the Principles for Responsible Banking, we were one of the banks who drafted that with the global banks. One of the good things about that is we get to shape or help to shape the regulation. BNM has to be on speed down, so does SC. I'm not, not sure that's a good thing, but, but yeah, we get to try and help to shape that and, and, and lead that. Um, but, you know, um, I think... I don't think it's right to say, okay, I'm going to wait until I'm forced to do it because do you really want to be caught on your back foot? I'm sure a lot of banks out here are panicking about the climate risk uh, exposure draft. Uh. So do you really want to do that? And it's also saying like, okay, you know what? Taking vitamins is good for me, but until you make me take my vitamin, I'm not going to take my vitamin because nobody's making me or nobody's giving me an incentive to do it. I think that's just a ridiculous way of thinking about things. Um, if it's something is right, just go and do it. Nasri, to your, to your questions, which are on... Um 
matrix matrices and um, DFI be reporting to different stakeholders. Yeah, yeah definitely uh, with DFI reporting to different stakeholders, there are going to be differences in uh, priorities, put it that way. Yeah? And to be fair, we are also starting our journey and we're just collecting data now. And I think uh, in uh, at least in the next once we have three years of full cycle, then we can share that and see what is the impact and maybe the other DFIs. Because I don't think they cannot not benefit from it. I think it's the same foundation in terms of what sustainable carbon, job creating social, it's all similar. What may change is maybe some DFI will have higher weightage on certain SDG as opposed to others because their mandate is different. So you could have that, the same bottom line uh, SDGs, but different weightage for some. Yeah. So it's going to be a journey of learning, uh, but I would love, I mean, once we have enough data to share with the other DFIs and see whether they can incorporate it or add on to our own journey. So one of the things that was spoken about in other industries was why should I socially comply, i.e. why should I give very high standards to foreign workers when other smaller ones don't? So maybe the government could think of incentives in tax for the ones who could do comply. Yeah. Uh, who do make that go the extra mile to give better accommodation, better standards of living, better whatever, uh, above market standards that they get um, incentivized vis-a-vis -vis tax or other, other sort of incentives to promote. So that the ones, because um, the argument of, say for example, in the glove industry, um, there are a lot of glove makers popping up everywhere. So, so and it's a very competitive market now. And the gloves, um, are priced at the same value, uh, <laughs> at the same cost, except that those who are for, uh, complying to the highest standards, their cost of doing business naturally yeah. rises. Yeah. So that, that's the incentive or not of doing it. So if I can turn to Bilal on the Islamic banking uh, perspective. Sure. Uh, thanks, Fairo. So <clears throat> I think you asked me a couple of things. One was that how does Malaysia compare regionally? Uh, and second was on the Islamic finance Correct. and the ESG yeah. convergence. So if I talk about Malaysia, I think, uh, look at the Islamic finance industry where it is today, right? So we are at about 38%. Look at the halal industry. So, and it's, a lot of it is regulatory driven, either through direct intervention or through incentives. And that's helped achieve Malaysia uh, glo global standard in terms of sukuk, advancement, banking policy framework, halal industry where it stands today. Malaysia is taken as a global halal hub and ESG, while we're talking about it in this panel today, a lot of things regarding framework standards. The work started in 2017. And uh, I mean, fortunately, I was a part of it. So I, I've kind of seen that through uh, jointly with the other banks. So that speaks of the foresight of the regulator that thought that how does Islamic finance ups its game in terms of the next level of growth? Yes, we are at 30%, 34%, we'll hit 38 But what's the difference? Will Islamic finance move beyond replicating conventional term loans and trade loans? What is the value add that Islamic brings? And that is social finance, uh, how Islamic can go and link the philanthropic money, the zakat, the sadqa, the waqaf, to the right uh, recipients. How does the intermediary, I mean, I, I really like the word lens used, right, intermediary. How does that intermediation creates a value for the society? And that's what Islamic banking can do. And that is also a value differentiation between conventional and Islamic. So that's a step up that the industry uh, is now taking on back of the VBI as the uh, baseline for, for the uh, development. And I, in, the, in the markets where Strandchart operates, or I work closely with my peers, we haven't seen any such development take place. Yes, there are active dis discussions that we're having. We are, we are jointly presenting with the regulator to other regulators on what, we, what Malaysia has achieved and what Mal Malaysia plans to do, because probably that's a common parallel that we can see in Middle East, that we can see in South Asia, which are the other Islamic banking markets. So yes, Malaysia is really ahead of it. When it comes to Islamic banking, where we are seeing some excellent products by a local bank, CIMB, by Bank Islam, by Maybank, which go and touch the really underserved segment through that social finance, through that microfinance. And those instruments are not just financing or microfinancing uh, through FIs. We are seeing fintechs coming in, fintechs stepping up in Indonesia, which has a huge case of, for financial inclusion. And that's all being done on Sharia compliant, ESG linked, financing, supporting the society and the economy, something which probably was missing 10, 10 years ago, but that work is now 
advancing. Last example, ESG wealth. So today you can have a digitized ESG wealth solution which automatically purifies your money by sending some of the income drive through to zakat or to sadaqas which are governed or regulated by government, et cetera, et cetera. And then you see an impact report coming up onto your app on that platform. That's how easy it is. So that's so, so again, we are just scratching the surface. There's a long way ahead in terms of ESG financing, social financing, creating impact on the society and the economy. So yeah, ex exciting journey ahead. Thanks. Justin, a couple of questions from I think yeah. I think you posted a couple of questions to me. I think number one would be on the flood rates, right? Let me quote a few data points, um, just, just so that we know how, how severe is flood, flood rates to the con, con, country. I think data point number one is the uh, global disaster database, right? So we collected natural disaster information of Malaysia for the past 50 years, right? The occurrence of flood rates is ranging from 70 to 80 percent, right? So, so what? So what does that mean? 80, 80 to 70 percent of natural disaster that ever happened in the history of Malaysia since independence are flood risks, right? And the rest are heat wave, um, couple of incidents on tsunami, drought, etc., right? But those are things. Those are the mi minority 20 20 percent. So, so, so number two that I will kind of quote is the Department of Statistics Malaysia. Right. Remember the, the, the flood that happened from de December to, Jan to January, right? Um, the amount of losses as a country that we have lost due to that one single incident is 6 billion ringgit. 6 billion ringgit we have lost over one single event, right? So you think about this wicked pro problem and trying to think about what does it mean to the FIs, right? I think a, a few things that will, will kind of prompt the, the, the bank, the financial institutions to think about, number one is re, re, really the credit risk from a borrower perspective, right? From the consumer, the SME, the corporate that has been affected by, by the flood, right? And how does it really affect their repayment pat pattern? I think that's, that's really a very important one. The second one, especially for especially Bila talk about is, is Islamic finance. Islamic finance always believe in a real economy, real asset, as, asset based fine, fine financing, right? So the second one is really the direct acute and chronic Im impact to the properties, right? Especially you are into some form of real estate financing, right? So so I I help FI to look into heat map. Right. So Im imagine if you can put the Malaysia map in, into it and trying to imagine how, how does the flood risk heat map will look like. And you, you, you're trying to think about when we have con consumer coming in to, to borrow a mortgage again. If, the mor if a mortgage ad address, if a residential ad address is part of a high risk area versus a low, low, low risk area, that, that should change. Um, that will change certain fact factor as you are thinking about underwriting those, right? The third is really about the operation risk because um, thinking about the distributions of your branches, right? So where are branches located, whether it's high risk area, low risk area, the disruptions that you have got, gotten, do you have enough insurance to cov cover up your operation risk? I think those, those are the few, few factors that I think will be important to, for FI to start think, thinking about it. I think a second question is around more regulation, less regulation, self-regulation for better ESG. One word answer. <laughs> right. I would think enough regulation, sufficient okay. regulation. So that's reg more regulation, reg I think. And I, I would like to quote. I would like to quote. <laughs> um, I would like to mm. quote APRA on this one, right? Mm. Um, I think one of the statement that APRA made in public in November is that um, no data, no technology, um, or no in a way, best practices when it comes to ESG, it should not stop banks from not doing anything, right? So inaction is no longer an excuse. We need to start to see progress. Thank you. Pramod, where are you? Can we have Pramod, please? Okay, shareholder activism. Are we ready? Not ready? How do we educate market as opposed to just blocking them out and or them 
or them um, attacking, a, a, how do we create collaboration as opposed to confrontation? So what, what is the question? Oh, did you not take down the question, Promote? This is what happens when you're offside. So shareholder activism, how does that affect, how, uh, how are banks, FIs and regulators preparing themselves with um, the rising shareholder activism, not just for FIs, where they question uh, the motives of your ESG, but also they question the motives of companies um, with social co compliance issue primarily, and also like uh, where boards are now also being taken to task on, in indivi on individual capacity. For example, recently Shell board members were sued on individual capacity. Okay, I, I, by I, NGOs. I'm going, I, I'm going to go at tangent to your question. Uh, so, but don't um, go uh, off tangent on the time. So you have like two minutes, like to do I, this. I will, <laughs> I will say it in one minute. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> the 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 issue is not what we are talking about today. Um, basically, what we are talking about today is not doing something, or making it costly, or moving money in a particular direction away or towards something green. The issue is most of our economy is brown. Um, even, the, um, even the leading corporates ha have to invest quite a lot in getting resources to report. But the economy is driven by SMEs. Um, these SMEs, if they are part of a global supply chain, uh, whether they will be knocked out or not, that will be another issue. So um, the issue is to deal with the transition uh, into a greener, more sustainable world. And how would Malaysia's uh, SMEs uh, and broader industries fare? Um, and uh, maybe this is a question that uh, Nasri will have to think about uh, because his agenda as a development bank would be different. And uh, finally, the the long-term uh, situation is, um, it's no longer anything special. ESG is, is already baked in. Um, and I'll end with that earlier point I had, everything will be incorporated into pricing and that will be the, uh, what brings uh, everything to equilibrium. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in the remaining eight minutes, do we have any questions from the floor? No questions. Oh my God. Like we fully answered, or it's like really dragging it to 5.30. <laughs> None whatsoever. So I'll ha I have a couple of questions left. Um, offshore accounts, are they compliant with ESG principles? Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, Pandora Papers, Swiss Bank. How, how does the whole concept of sustainability views offshore accounts? And some of these um, um, papers that have come out quite controversially. Quick one, one sentence answers. I know this is like a topic on its own. Um, Luan? ESG, right? So that's the G part. Yeah. Very simple answer. <laughs> OK, uh, out. It's just governance, right? Uh, whether they're trying to hide something or not. Uh, and whether that yet yet banks are involved in, in enabling this, no? Is it? <laughs> <True>? <laughs> are they not global banks? I think the mic is not working. <laughs> <laughs> Justin from Risk Management Perspective. I will, I will echo Luin on the G part. And promote. Oh, there's enough information you can Google. I think the answer will be there somewhere. Okay, um, I'm not going to um, drag this any longer. Um, just one closing question for all member, uh, all panelists. Given the many human rights and sustainability issues that are hotly debated since the war of Ukraine broke, since the war in Ukraine broke, how, in your view, the financial institutions will need to revisit its own stand on sustainability henceforth, vis-a-vis -vis conflict zones? Should it operate? Should it not? What will it risk? Uh, and what will the lending metrics be? I know this is a huge topic. I think uh, succinct answers will be good as a closing. And then I'll close the session. Okay. 
So whenever we look at sustainability, it's always on a holistic basis, right? So you can say, oh, I want to save the orangutan, but I have somebody who is literally starving to death, right? Or in, in the case of the war, literally being bombed to death. So, so it's a matter of weighing all the different factors and the least of all evils, right? Um, but on the other hand, we have people who say, oh, there's a war, okay, everything is... Uh, Everything is uh, cut blanche already. Can do anything because there's a flaw. There's, there's a war, right? So, for example, when COVID hit, the Indonesian government revised a lot of their uh, regulations on mining when nobody was looking because everybody was talking about COVID. So, so is I have a feeling that you know people will use this excuse to then go and do whatever it is. So that's the that's the danger of it. Nazri. Yeah. No, at the end of the day, is uh, you want to do the right thing, right? And there's going to be a cost to it. Can you live with that cost? Yeah. It's just a simple, simple answer to it. If the cost is to your own detriment of your people's survival, then how are you going to live with that cost? Right? So. Bala? I think it's more of, uh, as, as Shrenchart, we are governed by various regulators from UK to the markets where we operate uh, in terms of standards, frameworks, policies. So it's more of compliance to them at any given point in time in a particular market in a particular country. So as long as we are in compliance, though, so that's our utmost priority at all times. Justin, I think to me, sustainability is um, is closely related to two words, right? I think purpose and value crea creations. In a grey area like, like like this, I will be guide guide gathered by: is there a purpose to it? Are we creating value to the real e economy? Uh, and promote. Well, you do certain things during an emergency and you do certain things during a steady state. So uh, okay. you, you just have to think on your feet at that time. I think um, I, I, I feel um, in closing, um, I would do real injustice trying to summarize the work of these five distinct um, people here. So I will not even attempt to summarize because they are way above my level of, 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 of intellect. Um, so I will not accept to say that uh, one, uh, one um, message cut across uh, consistently through all, that Malaysia has a lot of work to do. It has a lot of work to do, not just locally, but also internationally. It has a lot of work to do uh, with its SMEs, because over 90% 90, 90 of our industry is driven by SMEs. And we, we are actually exposed to supply chain issues, real supply chain if, issues, if we do not deal with it. Uh, and then also our policy makers really, we've just ratified ILO, uh, International Labour uh, Organization uh, remits, after many sanctions imposed on Malaysia, we should really be on top of the game uh, from the policy ma making perspective, not private sector leading the cause and then paying a certain price and then policymakers uh, suddenly saying, oh, it affects our market. Um, and on that note, I have uh, a two-minute video to just encapsulate the points I've just made on um, intergovernmental panel on climate change, which was, um, they issued a report in February 2022 that essentially says uh, the planet is in, on a critical, in a critical moment. And on that note, I thank you, I thank the organizer and thank Tan Sri Michael for <laughs> giving me this opportunity and all of us. Um, and thank you all for staying to 5.30. So just two more minutes if you can bear the, the video. It's actually a fantastic video, so thank you.
on that note, we no longer just live in Malaysia, we live in the world. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe.